Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Iyer. Now, most of us who are students of logic, we know that there are two states of logic in the Abrahamic concept: true or false. How does that translate to what was the number of states that we had in Hinduism in the ancient Hinduism? Turns out there were more than two. To know more about this, we go to the modern-day Rishi, uh, Professor Subhash Kak. Professor Subhash Ji, welcome to P Guru's channel. Thank you very much, Sri Ji. Uh, delighted to be a part of this uh, continuing conversation. <laughs> so, uh, according to um, you know logic system in Hinduism, there are not two, but there are more than two states, isn't it? So, how do you explain more than two states? I mean, if there are more than that, what are they? And perhaps you could share some examples of why these states were evolved. Well, um, there are. Um, many different aspects to this question of logic. The first is uh, the emergence of logic in the West itself, which is normally credited to Aristotle. And uh, the story is very interesting. The story is that when Alexander, who was Aristotle's student, came to the frontier of India, there was also in his group a relative of Alexander, namely Callisthenes, who had been sent by Aristotle to bring texts from India. And according to later uh, legend, in India, as well as uh, amongst the Greeks themselves, the Greeks got their logic from India. In fact, within India, uh, there is this scholar Mohsen Fani, who wrote in the 17th century, who mentions this very explicitly. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, there's also another very interesting story, which uh, uh, would be amusing to very many, that Aristotle's own student, who died in Bactria uh, claimed that the Jews themselves, who were philosophers, like the Brahmins of uh, India, came to the West, namely to Israel uh, from India. So this is, of course, something very interesting, not quite directly um, uh, to the question of uh, logic. So now this is one. The other is in standard logic, we have two categories. We have something exists or something does not exist, right? Yes, you have, yes. We have a set or the negation of a set. Now, in the Nasidiya Sukta of the Rig Veda, you have something much deeper. In the Nasidiya Sukta, you have the statement, uh, uh, Nasad Asit, uh, uh, no, uh, yeah, no, um, uh, Sat Asin. In other words, there was no sat and there was no asat. So in other words, what it really means is a situation which has been called chatushkoti or a four, four part uh, logical statement. And this goes to the very heart of uh, the deepest uh, Vedic uh, uh, um, wisdom. And what, what this means is that you have something and you have the absence of it, then you have the two of them together. But then you can also have a state where there is an absence of this and the absence of it. So that represents four categories. Now, how is this possible? Well, in Western logic, you are only talking about things, right? So you can have something or the absence of it. And even Western medicine is based on it. Um, you, you are ill or you're not ill. Now, in the Indian tradition, in the Vedic uh, insight, you have things, so you talk of this or the absence of it, but you also have something transcendent, which is beyond these things or the absence of it, you know, which is the Purusha. And this is the very, this permeates all of uh, Vedic uh, exegesis, you know, wherever you go, and often this concept has been misunderstood by even historians of philosophy because normally all historians are talking about things, right? Things are concepts or events or non-events. So the idea of transcendence is something that escapes most of them. And that's why they're lost in. Okay. Them. So this is one aspect. The other aspect is that uh, this logic, which apparently, according to legend, was carried from India to Greece, and this is, of course, within the darshanas, the Nyaya system, right? Uh, 
Now, the Nyaya system eventually, about a thousand years ago, gave rise to what is called Navya Nyaya system. And in the Navya Nyaya system, you have other conditions which can be discussed when you are looking at events or you're looking at things. And that is what leads to uh, what is called multi multiple valued logic, or, or it can also lead to uh, discussion of conditioned output, which is at the basis of uh, modern machine theory. Because what is it uh, a computer does? Computer is not only looking at straightforward events or statements, it's also looking at more conditioned statements where an event A depends also on B or C and so on, right? Now, a side light to this story is that uh, mathematical logic in the West arose in the 1850s, and there were three famous figures, um, De Morgan, Babbage, and Boole. And according to Boole's wife, Mary Boole, after she was widowed, she wrote a book in the 1890s, where she claimed that these three learned uh, their ideas of logic uh, from George Everest, who was Mary Boole's uncle and who was the Surveyor General of India for a long time, after whom uh, the Everest Peak is named. And so she suggested that these, these ideas of Navya Nyaya came to these three pioneers in England from India through uh, George Everest as the intermediary. So this is another very, very interesting aspect to this story. Now, um, how does this relate to the concept of time? For instance, uh, time is linear in Western philosophy and science, whereas in Indian philosophy, uh, Sanatana Dharma, time is cyclical, Kala Chakra, right? So, I mean, the, the Sanatana Dharma accepts time as being cyclical, whether it is Buddhism or Jainism or Hinduism, any of those things, it's, the time is cyclical. How, how do you see any relationship between the, the logic states and their time? Well, the cyclicity of time is a different matter. Cyclicity of time means that there is creation and then there is destruction because everything goes through different phases. Uh, that doesn't do anything as far as logic is concerned. Uh, I, I forgot to add uh, one more thing about logic. Now, you look at Ayurveda. Ayurveda has three uh, conditions, you know, three kinds of doshas. And so... Uh, you mean Pitta, Vata and uh, Kapha or something like that? Yeah. Pitta, Vata and Kapha. Yeah. Uh, and in the Ayurvedic system, every patient must first be assessed for what specific uh, dosha they have or yeah. preponder preponderance of dosha they have. And based on that, a certain very personalized uh, treatment is... Uh, is uh, determined. Now in Western allopathic medicine, and the word allopathic means which treats the symptoms. I think Correct. the word allo right. right. refers to that. You either have a symptom or you do not have a system. Or you do not have a system. So this is a kind of a binary logic system. While the Ayurvedic system with three states uh, is a richer system. Now, it's also very interesting that uh, from the perspective of uh, information theory, a ternary logic is superior to binary logic, that uh, you have more efficient uh, uh, representation of systems or events if you have a ternary logic. So what is the third state, sir? The third state could be maybe, yeah. Okay. There is something or but there is something, something similar to don't care or don't care or we do not know. Okay. And that is also something that we have in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, you cannot always determine the state of a system. You may be aware of it or you may, you may know that it exists, a certain attribute, or you may know that it doesn't exist, or you may not even know whether it exists or does not exist. So that from that perspective as well, uh, the study of logic mathematically has shown that uh, the ideas of uh, India, which go back, as we said, to the very Nasadiya Sukta, which is 10.129 of the Rig Veda, which uh, indicate that uh, you must also consider states that go beyond the, the framework, the universe of 
possibilities of things that you've already uh, begun uh, with in your framework. So you go beyond that and that provides you for the insight. Uh, fascinating is the only word that comes to my mind. Now, um, I just wanted to ask you one other question. See, I'm winging these questions and I could be completely off the park, so please feel free to correct me. Schrodinger's equations. It, it, it is, isn't there something there that alludes to one of the states that uh, Hinduism refers to? Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger was this Austrian founder of uh, quantum theory, which as we all know, is at the basis of all of modern physics. It's at the basis of chemistry, biology, cosmology, and so on. And Erwin Schrodinger in his own autobiography mentions that the fundamental idea of quantum mechanics, which is of superposition, that the state uh, of the um, of the object, of the atomic or you know, similar object, is a sum of all different possibilities. He claimed that he got it from the Upanishadic Mahavakya, I am Atma Brahma. In fact, in his, when he writes about it in his autobiography, he mentions that, look, Upanishadic statement, Atman is equal to Brahman, which is, of course, in Sanskrit, I am Atma Brahma. So what does it really mean? What it means is that uh, the state is a sum of all possibilities. But then the Schrodinger equation itself is a deterministic equation, which says that the state will then evolve in a way which would be determined by the system that is being considered. Now, at its deepest level, what the Schrodinger equation says, or if you were to write it in English, you would say that according to Schrodinger, according to the deepest evolutionary idea in quantum mechanics or in all of physics, that the rate of change is equal to the state of the system or the rate of change of the state is equal to the state. That's what Schrodinger's equation says. And that's what allows you to provide all kinds of wonderful things that eventually emerge when you are looking at properties of atoms and then their uh, relationship mutually, which uh, help us go to um, chemistry and uh, beyond. So, so it, it's becoming more and more apparent that most of the logic and, and, and the modern day science has all its funda foundations in, in our Vedas and our Upanishads. And someone who happened to know these things, stumbled upon these things, translated them in a way that was you know, understandable to the, to the West. And, and, and thereby they have become the, you know, they've claimed the mantle of being uh, the original founders of it, but it's really not true. Everything seems to find its way back to Vedas and Upanishads. I would not put it the way you put it. What I would say that the Rishis thought very hard and they were not talking about deities or gods or whatever in the Shastras, say in the six Darshanas and the other Shastras, where they, um, thought about, hey, how does uh, logic work, which is Nyaya, or what is the nature of physics, which is Vaisheshika, where they said there are four kinds of atoms, for example, or that an object moves unless you interfere with it, which is one of the laws of motion, or uh, a principle such as Karya Virodhi Karma, which means that to every action, there is an opposite reaction. So you had all these principles, or then you had Sankhya and Yoga, Sankhya about creation, how there is evolution. So there was evolution uh, both at the cosmic level and at the individual level in Sankhya. In Yoga, how do you bring it together? How does your individual self able to then reach into the very heart of your being, which is this one, which is Purusha or which is consciousness? And then you also had uh, Purva Mimansa, which is about uh, your tradition, which when you question can also lead you to a deeper insight. And finally, Vedanta, you know, what is reality? So all of these things have been thought as sharply as is possible. And generally people were aware. And then of course, you also have supplementary sciences, you know, like uh, architecture, you have music, there was in the Natya Shastra, an amazing exposition, not only of music, but also of gesture, of how do you do Abhinaya and so on. 
And then you had astronomy, Jyotish, and so on. And so much so that writing in about 1100, the Arab um, Andalusian, which is from Spain, Said Andalusi said, yes, India is the first nation of, amongst all as far as science is concerned. Now, of course, after the 17th or 18th century, uh, European sages also approached reality and they, they were aware of what India had done. They were aware of Indian Jyotish. And as we saw uh, mathematical logic, they were aware of Navvi Nyaya or uh, the rise of computer science. They were aware of Panani and Panani's uh, use of meta language and all that. Linguistics all goes back to Panani. So India was truly the first among all nations until the arrival of the British. And then India fell into this uh, period of darkness. India's share of world economy collapsed from 30% or so to about 3% by the time the British left. And they did it so gently because they didn't allow industrial revolution to take root in India that Indians did not even know the degree of devastation that had occurred in India. In particular, the whole um, indigenous uh, system of education was destroyed because they said everything should be done in English. And, and those partshalas and those other schools, which were a part of the temples, were wound up. So that now we have very few people who are aware of all these Indian sciences. And in fact, I'm quite convinced that these sciences would still provide some of the most central ideas to make the next breakthroughs in, for example, in consciousness science, because that is the ultimate frontier, right? We don't know who the observer is, either in quantum mechanics or in neuroscience or in computer science. So we do need further advances. And I'm quite convinced Indian uh, Shastras, which is Indian sciences. I'm not talking about bhakti or religion or whatever else. Indian sciences have a lot to offer to the world. It's my great plea to India and to Indian um, scholars and other well-wishers, please do not abandon it. Please let's uh, get connected to Indian shastras and sciences in a, uh, in a scientific way and see, first of all, celebrate what was known then and to see how all of this can help us to go to the next uh, frontier uh, for all of humanity, not just for India, because this is universal knowledge. Such profound thought. Thank you very much, Professor Subhashji. And uh, I have a whole series of ideas lined up and I hope to you know, drop on your time to you know, bring out more and more as we cast more light into some of these very profound subjects. I hope your viewers uh, uh, you know, uh, got the gist of what Professor Subhash Kak was saying. I would encourage you to watch this video more than once if for some reason you, know, you have dif difficulty in comprehending it. And finally, do not forget to press the subscribe button. Thank you very much, Subhash Kak Ji. Danyavada. Really enjoyed Danyavada. it.